Is it going? Yeah. Ah, are you sure? Uh-huh. Fantastic. Karis? There's no offence, as me, but can you check that it's going? Because it's really disappointing if we get to the end of the recording and it hasn't started properly. And that has happened to us. Welcome back, family. Family by... Yes, it was her. Um, <laughs> bl- naming no names, but just for fun, we'll call them... Oh, that's not very nice, is it? No. Um, someone did that to me once. It scarred me for life. Well, we're, we're in the park. This is After Church Fellowship. Uh, welcome to Juliet, to Amma, and to some of the Owens, the Owen girls. Here they are. The Owen girls, the Owen boys are going to have to watch this tomorrow. <laughs> yes, that's right. But the Owen girls will be a day ahead. Girls get ahead that way, don't they? <laughs> By being organized and disciplined. And then the boys have to catch up. Well, we're in family Bible time. We are in Jeremiah chapter 32. So if you find your way there, let me pray. And we'll get started. Lord, thank you for food for our souls this morning. Thank you for the testimonies in the church. Thank you for your kindness to us, saving people and adding them to the church. We pray your blessing upon them. Pray your blessing upon Michael now as he continues to preach. And we pray that you'd be with us as we study your word together in the park. Bless us and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, um... Jeremiah, for those of you who have not been following Family Bible Time, Jeremiah, we're in the middle of this whole mess of the uh, judgment being poured out upon Judah before they go into captivity. And the last two chapters are are the first two chapters of three chapters that form what some people have called the Book of Consolation in the middle of of Jeremiah. So in chapter 30, all the way to chapter 33, so that's four chapters, not three chapters, um, there's a whole load of comfort, consolation, in the middle of all this message about judgment. That's good, isn't it? And you were there just the other day, were you, when we had a lot of judgment, didn't we? Yeah, so so we're going to get some consolation today. Would you like that? Let's do it. Chapter 32. Oh, hello, pigeon. Chapter 32, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. In the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. Which king was Zedekiah? The last last one before the exile. Okay. So you remember that? Jehoiakim had a chin. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Um, Which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. So this is a lot of time, isn't it? 605, Nebuchadnezzar comes along for the first time, Battle of Carchemish, and the first exile where Daniel went into exile. And then 586 is when they, when the temple was destroyed and the last of them went into exile. Okay. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. And Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had imprisoned him, saying, Why do you prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. And he shall take Zedekiah to Babylon, and he shall, and, and there he shall remain until I visit him, declares the Lord. Though you fight against the Chaldeans, you shall not succeed. Now, if you don't notice the question mark, you might get lost in all of that. But that's King Zedekiah asking Jeremiah, why do you say all this stuff? And he's quoted his whole prophecy back to him. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you and say, Buy my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then Hanamel, my cousin, came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field that is in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. 
then I knew this, that this was the word of the Lord. That's interesting, isn't it? Because when, when it's really the word of the Lord, when, when a prophet like Jeremiah received the word of the Lord, he would get that kind of confirmation. I know this is exactly, it had to happen exactly the way God said in order for it to be really clear that it was the word of the Lord. Okay. And I, brought, and I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money for, to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed and sealed it, got witnesses and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. By the way, these were all really primitive people running around in caves. They didn't know anything about... They, they were just so primitive that they didn't know what the... They didn't know how to kind of understand true religion. And so we've, ev we've evolved since then. We've kind of become sophisticated and civilized. Oh, no, we haven't. They were exactly the same as us, weren't they? Did you get the sarcasm, Esme? <laughs> Hopey. Sorry. You're Hope, aren't you? Esme. All right. I get confused sometimes. Uh, where am I? Verse 13? Verse 12. And I gave the deed of purchase to Barak, the son of Neriah, son of Maaseiah, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. I charged Barak in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in, the earthen, in an earthenware vessel, that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a couple of questions, quick questions. One is, why would anyone make up all this detail? This is just, this is history, isn't it? This is not, this is not somebody sitting down and thinking they'd write a religious story. And you've got to get that into your head because a lot of the Bible is boring, isn't it? I mean, this is like boring detail. Why would someone sit down and make up all this boring detail? You'd have to have a motive, wouldn't you? It would take someone very, very boring and clever to make up a boring and clever story like this. And you, you, you just it's not plausible when people say it's all just made up. You read it and you think, no, it's not. This is, this is history. And a lot of history is boring detail, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Why did God record this boring detail for us? Actually, I told you earlier, this is part of the consolation. What would be comforting? What would be consoling about um, knowing that houses and fields are going to be bought again in the future? Why is, why is God saying that? There's a, present, a prize of a cheer for the first person who can answer. They will return back to land. Oh, Juliet, top marks. Okay, it's, it's an encouragement to them, isn't it? To say, look, they will come back to the land. So God is judging them. God is sending them into captivity. But God is saying to them, hold on. No, there is going to be a return from captivity. And this is like a sign to you. So that's what all this is about. Okay, verse 16. After I'd given the deed of purchase to Barak, son of Neriah, I prayed to the Lord, saying, Ah, oh Lord God, it is you who made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of fathers to their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts, great in counsel and mighty in deed, whose eyes are open, rewarding each one according to his ways, and whose eyes are open, thank you, to all the ways of the children of man, rewarding each one according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds. Um, now, just pause there for a second, children. God's eyes are open to the ways of the children of man. That includes you, doesn't it? Who else does that include? Me. 
You, yes, <laughs> and me. So God is watching, that's what he's saying, isn't he? Jeremiah's saying God is, God, God's not fooled. God's eyes are open. He sees what we do, even when we close the door and think that nobody can hear us. God sees, God knows. Right, verse 20. You have shown signs and wonders in the land of Egypt and to, and to this day in Israel among all mankind and have made a name for yourself as at this day you brought your people of Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and wonders, with a strong hand and outstretched arm and with great terror. And you gave them this land which you swore to their fathers to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is a long prayer, isn't it? Um, actually, long prayers are not unbiblical. That's good to know. And they entered and took possession of it, but did not obey your voice or walk in your law. They did nothing of all you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have made all this disaster come upon them. Behold, the siege mounds that have have come up to the city to take it. And because of sword and famine and pestilence, the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans who are fighting against it. What you spoke has come to pass, and behold, you see it. Yet you, O Lord God, have said to me, buy the field for money and get witnesses, though the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. And you see, Jeremiah's just like, wow, what are you doing, God? The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? You could put that on your wall, by the way. Put it on your fridge or maybe on your bathroom mirror. That's really helpful, isn't it? Hang on to that truth. Behold, I am the Lord the God of all flesh, is anything too hard for me? Put that in your prayer journal at the top. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall capture it. The Chaldeans who are fighting against this city shall come and set this city on fire and burn it with the houses on whose roofs the offerings have been made to Baal and drink offerings have been poured out to other gods to provoke me to anger. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. The children of Israel have done nothing but provoke me to anger by the works of their hands, declares the Lord. This city has aroused my anger and wrath from the day it was built to this day, so that I will remove it from my sight because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah that they did to provoke my anger, their kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned to me their back and not their face. And though I have taught them persistently, they have not listened to receive instruction. Quick question. Why do you think parents say to their children, now listen carefully? I mean, this is, this is just basic, isn't it? Guys, you're, you're sitting at home with your Bibles, hopefully your parents are with you, and when they teach you the Bible, they say to you, listen, right? They say, listen carefully. Why? Because it's so serious. What's the big lesson in the book of Jeremiah? Come on, someone was there the other day. What's the big lesson in the book of Jeremiah? Sin is serious. serious. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, is it serious. And, and so it, we need to listen to God, don't we? All right. Um, verse 34, they set up their abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it. They built the high places of Baal in the valley of the son of Hinnom to offer up their sons and daughters to Moloch. Are you glad that you didn't live then? That's good, isn't it? They, though I did not command them, nor did, I, nor did it enter my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin, 
This pigeon is just going backwards and forwards, <laughs> isn't he? It's a different pigeon. Is it a different pigeon? All right. They, they never listen, do they? <laughs> now, therefore, says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city which you, of which you say, it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them from all the countries to which I drove them in my anger and in my wrath and in my gr and great indignation. I will bring them back to this place and I will make them dwell in safety and they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant. Have you got this circled in your Bible, by the way? You need, you need to have this. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and will plant them in this, what does it say? What was that, Juliet? Land. land. Okay. I will plant them in this land. Sorry. In faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. Now, just a quick question again. I know I've done this loads of times in Jeremiah. Has that happened yet? Did Israel turn to the Lord with all their heart and all their soul? Did, did God put the, lo the fear of him in their heart and plant them in the land and never kick them out again? No. But will he? Well, if these words mean anything, then yes, he will. So this is a material, this is a, you would say, an earthly, this is a geographical promise made by God. Yes. Yes. All right, don't panic. She's asking if the microphone's on because she can't see the lights in the sun. That's okay. It is. For thus, the verse 42, For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought... Listen, this is, this is great. Just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, right? So the, the curses that Israel inherited were literal, right? Mm -hmm. They actually happened. So, I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. Okay, so if the curses were promised and inherited literally, then the promises of blessing also have to be inherited in the same way because God says, just as. So when he says, just as I did the curses, so I'm going to do the blessings, that means you know that God will one day actually bless Israel geographically. All right. Fields shall be bought in this land, of which you're saying it is a desolation without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. Fields shall be bought for money, and deeds shall be signed and sealed and witnessed in the land of Benjamin, in, or in the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah, in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the Shefla, in the cities of the Negev. For I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. Wow. Praise the Lord. All right, don't close your Bibles. We've got two more chapters. <laughs> but it's good, isn't it? This is good news. This is... Now think about... Do you ever look at videos of, of Israel? You should. You should have a look at some videos and sh look at the land of Israel. See what it's like in that land. And just think about it. One day, God is going to bless his people Israel in that land in such a way that these promises will come true. And all of God's people will start to believe again. Wow. They'll, they'll, his people Israel will, will have a new heart given to them. That's amazing. Verse 30, chapter 33. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah a second time while he was... Sorry. 
while he was shut up in the court of the guard. This is Jeremiah's um, Bunyan prophecies, prison prophecies. Thus says the Lord who made the earth, the Lord who formed it to establish it. The Lord, that's Yahweh, is his name. Call to me and I will answer you. And I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah that were torn down to make a defense against the siege mounds, against the sword, they are coming in to fight against the Chaldeans and to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I strike down in my anger and my wrath. For I have hidden my face from this city because of all their evil. Behold, I will bring it to health and healing, and I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me. And I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. And this city shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and a glory before all the nations of the earth who shall hear of all the good that I do for them. They shall fear and tremble because of all the good and all the prosperity I provide for it. Again, sorry to point it out repeatedly, but this hasn't happened yet. Okay, so Israel did come back from captivity. They were planted in the land again after 70 years. Think about Ezra, think about Nehemiah. But these prophecies have not been fulfilled yet, have they? It, 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 that didn't cause all the nations of the world to fear because of all the prosperity that he gave to Israel. Israel was still oppressed. First of all, the uh, Persians and then the Greeks and, and then the Romans were still oppressing them in the land. They were dominated by foreigners. So all of this is still to come. Thus says the Lord, in this place of which you say, it is a waste without man or beast, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man or without inhabitant or beast, there shall be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And now here's the psalm. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land. Ah, there goes the camera. All right, we're going again. Someone tell me where I was. It was like, I shall restore the fortunes yeah, we of the... <laughs> um, Jeremiah of chapter 33. Yeah. For I will restore, we're in verse 11, the end of verse 11. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in this place that is waste, without man or beast, and without man or beast, and in all of its cities, there, again, there shall again be habitations of shepherds resting their flocks in the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the Shefla, and in the cities of the Negev, in the land of Benjamin, the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah. Flocks shall again pass under the hands of the one who counts them, says the Lord. Okay, I mean, this is all good, isn't it? And, and we're making progress. I'm just going to keep going. I want to point out what's coming next. All, all of that's encouraging, but look at verse 14 onwards. The Lord's going to repeat his covenant with David. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days... And at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, 
and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Who do you think this is talking about, by the way? A righteous branch for David. Who is going to be called the son of David? Jesus, yeah, you're right. So this is the Messiah, isn't it? This is another name that was used for the Messiah. And so you can call the Messiah the branch in, in this prophecy. Um, in verse 16, in those days, in what days? In the days of the Messiah, Judah shall, will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. Are you worried about the wind? I think that will be securely. Well, I, I turned the tripod around so that it, it's got a, it's got something this way. Hopefully it won't blow over again. But we can't all worry about it, can we? <laughs> so let's, let's worry about the Bible and keep going. So now, now uh, eyes on the text. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. Now, if you want to say this all happened when Jesus came, oh, hold on a minute, How, Judah saved. Okay, you could say people were saved in Judah. That's good. You could kind of squint and say maybe it meant that. But Jerusalem shall dwell securely. Uh, that didn't happen when Jesus came, did it? In fact, 40 years after Jesus came, Jerusalem was destroyed. And this is the name by which it, sh it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Well, that hasn't happened to Jerusalem. So, um, look, these are prophecies that will be fulfilled in the time of the Messiah. And what is the time of the Messiah? Well, Jesus came the first time. He's gone back to heaven. But he's coming again, and he's going to come and rule and reign. And, and those are the days of the branch. So, this is when we're looking for it, is when Jesus comes back. Verse 17. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Here's another prophecy. Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne, and my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers. So, a uh, quick question for you Bible students. How do you understand the fact that for 2,000 years there hasn't been, in fact, for more than 2,000 years, since the return from exile, there hasn't been a son of David on the throne in Jerusalem. Okay, what happened to God's promises? People would say every promise of the word comes true. Yes, it does. Some of them are conditional, aren't they? This is, this is conditional on Israel's national repentance. And in case you haven't noticed, Israel hasn't nationally repented yet. But when they do, it's what Peter says, you know, if you read Acts chapter 3, about, it's about verse 21, he talks about, he tells the Jews in his sermon at the Gate Beautiful, he says, now repent and turn again that, as in so that, times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that the Lord will fulfill all the promises he made through the prophets long ago. These are the promises, right? So the promises, Acts 3.21, look it up. The promises are connected with the condition of Israel's repentance. You look at Zechariah chapter 14, those Hermeneia students who did it for their project. Zechariah chapter 12, 13 and 14. Israel repents and the Lord rules and reigns. The, 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 the condition of a son of David on the throne in Jerusalem is linked to the repentance of Israel. All right, good. Um, verse 19, the word, oh, I've done that. Where did I stop? 20. Where, 20 what? 21. That, so, if you can break his covenant with day and night, verse 21, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and my covenant with the Levitical priest, my ministers. Verse 22. As the Lord of hosts, as the as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, 
and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David my servant and the Levitical priests who minister to me. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, verse 24, Have you not observed that these people are saying, The Lord has rejected the two clans he chose. Thus they have despised my people, and they are no longer a nation. Uh, thus they have despised my people, so that they are no longer a nation in their sight. Thus says the Lord, if I have established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then, sorry, if I have not established, that's an important word, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For... I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. Okay, we've got one more chapter to go, but before we do, get this. Um, this is God saying to his people, Israel, I'm never going to reject you as a, what? Nation. Okay, well, that's kind of weird, isn't it? Because there are a lot of Christians even today, some of some wonderful, godly Christians that we would love and admire tremendously in all sorts of ways. But unfortunately, they would say God has rejected Israel as a nation. One of my favorite British preachers has said exactly that. And, and it's like, ah, oh, no, that can't be so. Look at these plain words in Scripture. And so we, what do we do with that? We, we, we say, well, the church hasn't replaced Israel as a nation. Okay, the church is the people of God in this age, Jew and Gentile combined. But has God rejected Israel? As Paul says in Romans 9 through 11, if, in summarizing, may it never be. <laughs> Chapter 34. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, and the kingdoms of the earth under his dominion, and all the peoples were fighting against Jerusalem and all of its cities. Here it comes. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. You shall not escape from his hand, but shall surely be captured and delivered into his hand. You shall see the king of Babylon eye to eye and speak with him face to face, and you shall go to Babylon. And all this happened, by the way, of course. Yet, hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord concerning you, you shall not die by the sword, you shall die in peace. And as spices were burned for your fathers, the former kings who were before you, so people shall burn spices for you and lament for you, saying, Alas, Lord, for I have, sp for I have spoken the word, declares the Lord. Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah, king of Judah in Jerusalem. When the armies of the king of Babylon was fighting when the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, Lachish and Azekar, for these were only fortified, the only fortified cities of Judah that remained. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to make a proclamation of liberty to them that everyone should set free his Hebrew slaves, male and female, so that no one should enslave a Jew, his brother. And they obeyed the, all the officials and all the people who had entered into a covenant, that everyone would set free his slave, male or female, so that they would not be enslaved again. They obeyed and set them free, but afterward they turned around and took back the male and female slaves that they had set free and brought them into subjection as slaves. And how do you think God felt about that? 
All right. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I myself made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, at the end of seven years, each of you must set free the fellow Hebrew who's been sold to you and has served you six years. You must set him free from your service. But your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. You recently repented. So, interesting, God recognizes it as repentance. You recently repented and did what was right in my eyes by proclaiming liberty each to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. But then you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took back his male and female slaves whom you'd set free according to their desire and you brought them into subjection to be your slaves. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me by proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother and to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim to you liberty to the sword, pestilence and famine, declares the Lord. I will make you a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts. The officials of Judah and the officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, and I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives. Their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials, I will give into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, which has withdrawn from you. Behold, I will command, declares the Lord, and will bring them back to this city, and they will fight against it and take it and burn it with fire. I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. Oh. Uh, what's the big picture in the book of Jeremiah again? Sin is serious, isn't it? So these people, they didn't think sin was serious. They made a covenant with God. They, you know what they did, it's a bit like Abraham. Do you remember Abraham and the covenant he made with the Lord? And the Lord, he cut the parts of the animals in half. And then in that covenant with Abraham, the Lord passed between the two halves of the, of the animal with a burning torch. That's an interesting thing, but that's how the phrase to cut a covenant comes. If you make a covenant in Hebrew, you cut a covenant. Because they, what they would do is they'd cut an animal in half. And then if you made a covenant with someone, like promising to not do something or promising to do something, you might cut an animal in half and you walk both parties of the covenant, you walk between the two halves of the dead animal. And you would say something like, may I be cut in half like this dead animal if I break my promise to you. Okay, that's, that's the original kind of covenant. That's what Abraham was gonna do with God, but, but actually God alone passed through the two halves of the dead animal as a burning torch. And God made the covenant with Abraham on his own that's called a unilateral covenant. That's amazing. Now, these people had made a covenant with God and said, we're going to do what's right and we're going to set the, set the slaves free. But then they broke their covenant. And what did God say? Well, God said, because you've broken the covenant, I'm going to make you like the two halves of the dead animals that you laid out. You broke your promise, says God. Now you're going to reap the consequences. Sin is serious. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would teach us not to mess with you. Lord, not to say one thing, to say to you, we're going to stop doing it, we're going to stop doing it, we're going to stop doing it, and then go back to it. 
Lord, we know that you see those things and you count them. Please forgive us our sin and our foolishness and please enable us to do what is right in your eyes and to live for you for, for the sake of your glory. Thank you for the covenant that you made with Abraham. Thank you that you will keep it. Thank you that the, for the new covenant that you made with the death of your son. Thank you for the forgiveness that is there for us through his sacrifice. And we praise you that he went all the way to the cross to pay for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are done. That was family Bible time. This was the crew today. <laughs> Juliet, Amma, Karis, Esme, Beth and Hope, Donna. What's my name? <laughs> Bye for now. Wave at these people. Come on. <laughs>